How many of us in this audience this morning have had a, a fine meal at, at Davio's? All right, all right. Steve, you're in good company. I'd say probably well over 90% of the audience raised their hands, so you're good friends. Only 90. Should we have another show of hands, the other hand? Uh, Steve DeFilippo is chef, chef and CEO of the well-known Davio's brand. He's with us this morning. Um, his story is pretty amazing. In 1985, at just 24 years of age, he bought a, a small restaurant business on what was then the up-and-coming section of Newbury Street in Boston, named Davio's, and literally transformed that restaurant into a fine dining destination. Um, he I apparently brought in a lot of his mother's recipes. He sort of injected some enthusiasm in the wine list. He redesigned the space. And the new Davio's was quickly branded as being innovative, creative, and bold. And I think for any of us that have had a meal there, I, I would certainly agree with that. And since then, Steve and his team have opened seven locations in Boston, Chestnut Hill, Linfield, Patriots Place, uh, Manhattan, Atlanta, and Philadelphia. Very impressive. So, but his passion for creating this overall incredible, incredible experience from authentic Mediterranean fare to upscale northern Italian recipes is felt really from, from Philly to Linfield. Um, impressive footprint. And he attributes his success in large part to the great group of people with whom he works, which is an HR person, I always like to hear that. And uh, many of his employees have remained with him since he started the business back in uh, that location on Newbury Street. What he does attribute much of his success to is his involvement in the community, his need to evolve to meet new expectations, and the people he hires. He's a BU grad. He attended the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts, and he's very prolific and active in many uh, boards and groups, both locally and nationally. In the fall of 2013, Steve published his first book, a little promo here for you, Steve, uh, entitled, It's All About the Guest, Exceeding Expectations in Business and in Life the Davio Way. We're actually going to have a raffle for this book this morning, so um, you may be lucky enough to, to win one. It's a memoir and a hospitality book which features both business advice for the successful restaurateur, but also those of us who are, only like to enjoy fine restaurants. So this morning, um, please join me in wel welcoming Steve DeFilippo, and he can share his insights with us. Well, thank you. That was, that was really nice. Half of it was not true, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, you know, last night when I was going to bed at like 9 o'clock, my wife said to me, why are you going to bed so early? I said, well, I have to get up really early tomorrow. She goes, well, why are you getting up so early tomorrow? I said, well, I'm speaking at Espain tomorrow morning. And she says, oh, that's, that's really cool. I, I said, you know, Pam, in your wildest dreams, did you think Espain would want to hear from me? And she said, Steve, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so, so, if, it, <laughs> so I went to bed alone. And, and then, of course, I want to thank you for having me. But 5 o'clock in the morning, I had to get up. I mean, I might go to the bathroom at 5 o'clock in the morning. But uh, so, you know, I got up and you know, everyone's sleeping in the house. My dog just didn't even open its eye. And I just walked by the dogs. And. I uh, got in the car and drove down 128, and I see all these red lights. I'm like, who are these people? I mean, <laughs> what time do they go to bed? Like, you know, I don't know. It's just the whole thing is kind of crazy to me, this getting up early thing. I mean, I like to get up 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Is that a problem? Yeah. All right, so Davios, all right? I started in 1985. That's true. Uh, I was a young kid, not knowing a lot. Uh, I was very fortunate, a great family. My father and my mom obviously helped me quite a bit when I first got started, and uh, you know, I was very lucky, you know, but my thing early on, I knew if I worked really hard and I got the right people as a team, I'd be okay. Uh, and so what I did is I put together a team, uh, and then we started expanding, and uh, we started to go to other cities, and uh, some worked, some didn't work. Uh, you know, and I learned along the way uh, what to work, do and what not to do. And right now we have seven restaurants, which I'm happy with. But we also have a food company. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story later about how that all started. Uh, we're in about 3,000 stores around the country. I don't know if you all know that, if you've seen our products in stores. 
Uh, a lot of guys in here, you probably don't go to store. It's amazing how many guys don't go to supermarkets, which freaks me out, because that's like my favorite thing to do, to go to the supermarket. Uh, you know, I get lost in there. So anyway, why is the book called It's All About the Guest, right? Well, you know, what, what does that mean? Well, every decision I make has to do with two people. The guest who walks through the front door, that's all of you, and the second person is who comes through the back door, and we call them our inner guests. Because I feel if I take care of those two people, I got it made, right? That's 100%. People in the front and in the back. So we, we really go all out. We make sure we have the best locations. We have the best, obviously, food. We really try to train our staffs correctly to make sure that when you come in, you're really well taken care of. But HR, you know, we make sure that our staff is really happy. In fact, we don't even like to use the word staff or employee. We call them our team, our team members. And, you know, I was one of the first restaurants back in the day to have health insurance, uh, to have vacations. I mean, I have a guy, uh, of the first 15 people that work at Davios uh, back in 85, I still have five of those people, which is kind of crazy, almost 30 years ago. And they get, they're up to about six weeks vacation. I mean, it's crazy because every... Five years, you get another week. So I don't know what's going to happen. These guys are going to have like six months off by the time we finish here. Uh, but, it, you know, I'm really proud of that. And we have a lot of guys with us 20 years, 15 years. And I think, you know, someone asked me earlier, you know, how do I keep expanding? And, and it's, it's all about the people. You know, I can't expand. You know, right now we have close to 800 people in our company. And sure, I got my little smartphone and I can communicate with everybody and see the numbers. But if I don't have the right people on the ground in each one of these restaurants running them, uh, you know, I'm not going to do very well. So I, I just can't take magic dust and throw it on them. You know, I have to bring them in and I have to work with them and really show them, you know, what Davios is all about. And it's been hard. I've made some mistakes and I'm the first to admit it. You know, I, I bring someone in and I think, wow, this, this woman's great or this guy's fantastic. And then I realize, you know, I, I messed up. So you really have to make that decision quickly uh, if you want to continue in business that make your decision fast with people, you know, and I've been really trying to do that. And the other thing is, you know, my father, you know, I learned a lot from my dad. You know, he, he is retired now. He's 87 years old. And <laughs> he used to run a company called Unifirst. Uh, it's still it's a very large uniform, industrial uniform company. It's based here in Wilmington, Mass. Uh, it's close to a $2 billion company now. And he retired a long time ago. But my uncle uh, started it with my dad back in the long... 50s, and now my cousin runs it, and my brother's in the company, my brother-in-law, uh, my, my whole family's in the company. Uh, I never wanted to go in the company. I kind of had my passion for, for this, for food, uh, so I didn't, I worked there as a kid, but, uh, so I moved on, but I learned a lot from that company, and I learned a lot from my father and my cousins, and uh, it was a big influence in my life, uh, so I was very fortunate uh, to have that, you know, and I, and I always tell people that, and so when I go see my dad, you know, he, the other day he calls me up, my father, he's, He's a trip, my father. He calls me up and he goes, you know, how's it going? And we're, you know, we're talking. And, uh, he has Parkinson's, so sometimes I don't really, you know, he stutters a little bit. So we talk for about five minutes, really about nothing, right? So finally, said, I go, Dad, did you call me for a reason? I'm sorry. What's going on? He goes, well, I didn't really want to say, but we're out of meatballs again. Can you bring some meatballs over? Because, you know, my mom doesn't really cook anymore, you know, because she's 86, you know. So I, I load up their freezer with, with stuff. And he's, the guy eats meatballs like crazy, you know, and I think it's why he's still alive, you know. So the other day, I go over there, and <laughs> this is so funny. I go in the, ki in, the, in, the, in the kitchen, and he's sitting there at the kitchen table eating the meatballs out of a to-go container. I go, Dad, you can at least put it in a plate. You, you know, he goes, oh, then your mother's got to clean the plate. I go, Dad, you have a dishwasher. You just put the plate in the dishwasher. He, I mean, it was kind of embarrassing, you know, eating them out of the meatballs. But that's what he loves. He'll, he'll have meatballs like every other day. But I love to go over there because he has such advice for me. And <clears throat> he said to me the other day, it's all about the people. Don't forget about the people, you know. And he's always telling me stuff like that. So I, I really, you know, I try to find people who are passionate as me. I and mean, if you don't have the passion for this business, you're in the wrong business because my business and a lot of your business, you know, we're seven days a week now. You know, car dealers are open seven days. I, I'm amazed how banks now, I see banks and supermarkets and all these crazy things. So I try to find people who love what they do so much because to me, our business is a calling. You have to want to do this. We work weekends. We work holidays. We work when everyone's off. I mean, that's, that's what it is. You know, I, I work nights. That's why I don't like to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know? But, 
you know, I love it so much, you know, and, and that's probably why most of my friends are divorced. I mean, it's just the way it is, you know, including me. I got divorced over 20 years ago because you've got to find the right mate who understands what our commitment is to our businesses. And I, and I, and I see that happen all the time. Uh, the people make that mistake. They, you know, once you own your business, you're not home at 5 o'clock. In fact, you, you work even harder, you know, and, I, and that's something that I always try to teach my people. Like, make sure your mate understands that your commitment to, to this place because you're not going to make it, you know, and I, I do that a lot. I, w I always try to tell people that, and, you know, I always hire people who have the passion that I have. I, I really try, you know, and, and occasionally, like I said earlier, I make mistakes, but just the other day in the restaurant, we had this gentleman, and it was, it was a party of like 50 people, and they had a limited menu. Uh, they had a choice of a bolognese or a top sirloin, and the guy ordered a bolognese, and I guess he didn't really like it, you know, which is shocking, because the bolognese is, I think, one of the best ever, uh, but uh, not, he didn't like it. So at the end of the meal, uh, we tried to get him a new one and something else. He didn't want it. So as the server is clearing his thing, he, she overhears him say to someone, geez, I wish I got the top sirloin that you got. That looked really good. So what did the server do? She went to the manager and told the story. And what did we do? We packed up a top sirloin for this guy and let him take it home. That's something, that, that's what you do. You know, you, you don't let that guest leave, like, unhappy. You know, we do crazy things like that. I'm telling you, that is not something that happens very common in, in a restaurant. Uh, and those are the things that I make sure our staff understands, that they know, our team gets it, that they know that the minute that person leaves that restaurant, first of all, let's talk about Yelp for a second. Do you guys Yelp? Does anyone here go on Yelp? Okay, please, L let me tell you about Yelp. What I want you to do before you go on Yelp is please notify the restaurant first. Can you give me a chance to fix the problem? Why do you have to tell the world about our little problem? All right. So you know, you know. I mean, I I guarantee you, I'm going to fix your problem. All right. And if I don't fix your little problem, because you know, sometimes you know, we 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 mess up. We don't. We we do. We I first a minute we mess up. But give me that chance, and then you don't have to go on Yelp and tell the world, right? And if I don't fix the problem, then go on Yelp and do what the hell you want. I don't care. But give me that one chance. I don't get to go, I don't know what you do for work, but do I get to go and Yelp about you and what you do? Because you probably made a mistake, did you? Have you ever made a mistake? You made a mistake? Never. Okay, well, you're perfect. There's always one of them in the audience. Uh, so please, give us a chance, because i got to tell you, I love to get those emails. Hmm. I love to get, I, I mean, I get all, all seven W's, I get, and the food products. I get people calling me from all over the country, you know, we only can get six spring rolls, and I only got five, you know, I was like, oh, you know. So I really get back to everybody, it's something I really do, and, and the Yelp thing just always bothers me. First of all, a lot of the people aren't even true, it's our competitors, it's, it's former team members who are unhappy, it's, a lot of it is just, it's just crazy, you know, I, I wish we could do something about it, but, uh, you know, Jim Rudolph, my lawyer here today, Jim, can we do something about that, can we, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. by the way, I'm, you know, people ask me all the time, you continue to expand, and I said, yeah, I'm going to continue to do one or two restaurants a year, as long as Jim Rudolph lets me sign a lease, the guy, like, drives me crazy, he won't let me sign a lease, it's always something crazy, and we're going through that right now, um, I want to talk about office, all right, I'm sure you guys all have an office, right? Well, you know what? I think offices are stupid, all right? I don't like offices, especially for me. I have an office somewhere. I have actually my accountant, Bob Kiley. He's on the Cape somewhere. He does our books. I've never been to his office. How about that? You know why? Because when he wants to meet with me, where do we meet? We meet at the restaurant. Why do I meet at the restaurant? Because that's where the, the action is. That's where our guests are. That's where my inner guests are. I don't need to go to an office. And I think... A lot of people make it and they think, oh, I'm going to go to the office today. What the hell do you do in an office? I don't understand it. You know, I got into the restaurant business to not be in an office. In fact, I have a leather coach bag that I carry around with all my stuff. You know, now I got the phone. I don't need to go to an office. And, uh, you know, occasionally in the afternoon, I, of course, you have to go to a computer and do a few things. But I don't think it's, it's a good thing for restaurateurs uh, or anybody who's in a service business. You never watch that show, The Boss Show, um, what's it called? Undercover Boss. And you see these CEOs that have no clue how their companies run. I, I mean, I can't believe they let them go on TV. In fact, my cousin Ronnie was actually on. I'm making fun of my cousin. Uh, Universe was on a couple years ago, and he went. To, you know, they have 10,000 
people in the company. It's a massive company. But, you know, I don't understand that. You know, I think if in our positions, you should be in the front. You should be with your guests. You should be in these businesses. And I, you know, how many times you go to a restaurant, right, and you walk in, and, and it just seems like the inmates are running the asylum, right? You walk in, and, and the host... You know, it's on the phone, you know, on their little phone there, or, or, you know, talking to someone else. You look over at the bartender, and the bartender is trying to pick up the server, right? Then you look out the window, and you, you see the chef by the dumpster smoking. You know, I mean, all these crazy things, right? So, you know, it's because the owner is at the office, right? Or I don't know where he is, but he's not around, you know? And I don't really blame the people. You know, they're, that's, what, that's what happens. You know, we need to be in our businesses, and we need to manage them. And I... T and I and I know people look at me and go, "Why you got to go to the office. No, you don't. You know, I mean, I hire really good professional people. You know, like, you know, obviously Rudolph there. And, uh, you know, I have great accountants. And I, and I have all these people that ha handle a lot of that stuff. Because, you know, not that I don't know that. You know, I think I know everything, right? But I, I don't, you know. I, I get people who really help me out with that. And, you know, you, you can't forget to keep an eye on what you're doing. You know, you probably say, geez, you're in seven restaurants in four states. How do you do it? Well, I'm on a plane a lot, you know, and I'm in those restaurants as much as I possibly can. You know, I just don't run a company from here. You know, it's really important, you know, to, to get out there. You know, t I'll be in four restaurants today. So once I get out of here, I'm on my way. <clears throat> now, a lot of people think the restaurant business is, it's all about the food, right? You go to a restaurant to eat. You know, that's important. I'm a food guy. I went to cooking school. You know, I love food. It's all I think about. You know, that's why I run six miles a day because I, you know, I just get so fat. So I have to really watch what I eat. But it's really about the managers. It's really about the team. It's about the servers, the bartenders, the busters. Do you know how many hands food goes through by the time it gets to your plate? It, you know, we have a receiver, right? Then we got a prep guy, right? Then we have a line cook. Then we have a chef. Then we have a food runner. We have a server. I mean, it's just like it's endless, you know. So many different places where it can mess up. So if you don't have a really good team, I don't care how good the food is. How many times you go in a restaurant, right? And the food's unbelievable. You say, this is the best food I've ever had. But you know what? You didn't have a good time. You don't go back. Why didn't you go back? Well, maybe you didn't have value. Maybe the service wasn't that great. Yet, I love going to the 99. Right? I mean, it's not the greatest food, but I have the best time there. Or, you know, there's a lot of casual restaurants that they don't even have a chef. They have a kitchen manager, whatever the hell that is, you know. And I go there because I have a great time, you know, and I get great value, and I feel that, you know, I'm wanted there. You know, some of these fancy restaurants just make me crazy. You know, they, they, they have such attitude, you know. And I hope that Davio's, by the way, I hope at the end of this talk, the people who have been to Davio's still go back, okay. And, and, <laughs> And the ones who haven't gone, you better get going, okay? Because I'm, you know, I'm getting older, and I hope, you know, I want, I want you to be there, right? Um, but I want to tell you a story about how, why importance, why restaurants are so important, and because we have people that count on us, you know. I, we had this guy, Mr. Farrell, who would come in pretty much every Friday night to the restaurant, and I didn't see him for a little while, you know. I kind of wasn't really thinking about it, you know. But one day, uh, I'm looking out the door. And I see him, this is the dive on Newbury Street, and he comes down the stairs, and he opens up the outer door, and he shuts it, and goes back up the stairs. He continues to do this like three times. So finally, I go out there, and the stairs have come down, all right, and then there's the two doors. I walk out the two doors, I go, Mr. Farrell, what, what are you doing? And I look up the stairs, I go, is your wife coming down? He looks at me, and he goes, she's dead, Steve, she's dead. And I go, what? She, and, I, and I right immediately I said, God, is that a rookie mistake? It's like asking someone who's, you know, are you pregnant, right? You know, you don't, don't do that, right? So I, I said, oh, Mr. Farrell. He starts crying. I start crying. It was like a really emotional moment. It was so bad. So I said, he goes, Steve, I don't know if I can go in here. This is our place. You, you, you know how important Davio's is to me? I don't know how I'm going to go walk in there, you know? So I said, come on in. Let's go have dinner. Let's go sit down. Let's go see Tony and Howard. And so, you know, those are servers uh, since the beginning. So we go in, and I sit down with them. I had dinner with the guy. I sat down with them, and I heard the whole story about how this wife got sick, and she passed away, and he was so depressed and so sick. I mean, the, it was probably one of the toughest hour and a half of my life. But that's what you do, you know? And I got to tell you, it, it, I learned that after that day, I was like, whoa, 
Jesus, this restaurant thing's kind of important. You know, this, we, he counted on us so much. Uh, and that's when I really thought, you know, I, we better get our act together because people are counting on us. And I want to tell you, Mr. Farrell is doing very well. He ended up start, he started to go out with his, his uh, housekeeper, this uh, beautiful Brazilian woman. And so he had an epiphany one day. And I'm very proud of Mr. Farrell. Uh, he's, I got to tell you, he's doing great. Uh, so I, people always ask me, how's he doing? I was like, he's okay. He's all right. <laughs> it's kind of like Mr. Kraft. I think he's doing okay, too. <laughs> I love Mr. Kraft. I went to Israel with him, so he's, my, he's a good guy. That, in fact, Robert Kraft wrote the foreword of the book, and he had never done that before. I think Jonathan actually wrote it, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> He always gets mad when I say that. Uh, mentors. Mentors is something I always want to talk about because I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a million mentors. I mean, I, I got so many mentors, I can't even tell you. you know? And I'm always amazed when I ask people, you know, it's mother and father. Yeah, of course, we, those are, our, are probably our first mentors, right? But you never stop getting mentors. You know, I'm 53. I'm going to be 54 next month. And I'm always looking for new mentors. I mean, Rudolph's a mentor. I got a couple buddies here from high school. I mean, you never stop getting mentors. And one time uh, when I was, it was in the mid-90s, and I got a call one day from somebody who said, uh, Julia Child uh, is, needs to go down to an event down in Providence. Now, Julia Child to me, okay, is like Tom Brady to most of us today. I mean, she was, I grew up watching Julia Child and with my mom, you know, and these guys, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, I was obviously big in sports with these two guys that I've known my whole life, and they didn't know it, but I was a little of a sissy. You know, I would go home and watch TV with my mom and watch Julia Child, you know, and then cook, I would go, well, let's cook a chicken, Stevie, you know, and I would go cook a chicken. I mean, when I think back in my childhood, it was crazy. I'm trying to be tough with the kids, and then I'm in the kitchen with my mom cooking. But so Julia Child was such an important thing to me. So I get this call to have to take her down to Providence, just me and her. Now, I would see her at events, and she knew who I was, and I, we did a lot of charity events together. And, but anytime you see you're out with Julia, she was like a magnet for everybody. You can really get a conversation with her, you know? So here I am, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna have Julia in a car for an hour. You know, this is so exciting. So I went over to Cambridge at her house, you know, and I don't forget, I go up, I open the door and, you know, and I, and I go, hi, Julia, I'm here. And she goes, oh, Steve, I'll be right down, you know? And, and, I, and there's the kitchen that she cooked in and everything, it was so cool. And I'm so mad because I'm in the kitchen and no one's there, you know, right? I'm saying, God, I should take something, right? I should take something. <laughs> And now it's at the Smithsonian in Washington. Like they, I could have had something, you know, and I'm just too friggin' honest sometimes. Not all the time, but I was that day. So anyway, I get in the, so we get in the car, and we drive in a, and I have my questions, because you can probably tell I love to interview, and I love questions. So we go through Harvard Square, and it's kind of a rainy night. It's about 3.30, 4 o'clock. And I ask a question, and I, and I, and I know she doesn't really answer, right? And I look over, and she's... I mean, a loud snore, too. I mean, she's like, out, right? And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. You know, it's kind of like having a girl in bed, and then, you know, it's a very similar kind of situation. <laughs> so, <laughs> all ready to go, and they fall asleep, you know? Actually, I think it's my, I'm the one falling asleep now, I'm told. So, anyway, we get to Providence, and we pull up to the valet, you know? And now let's, I go, Julia, we're here, you know? She takes out her lipstick, you know, she puts on the lipstick, you know, and, you know, and she's like probably 85 at the time. But I can tell you, you wouldn't know it. She was, oh man, she's, first of all, she was like nine feet tall. I don't know if you know it. She's like this big, huge thing. So we get out of the car and we walk into the restaurant. At the time, it was at Davio's in Providence. So it was at, our, it was at, the, at our restaurant. So we go in and she goes, and Mayor Cianci was having dinner with us. I don't know if you remember the, the convict down there, the crazy guy. Oh, he's a, you know, he might be mayor again. I just, I, how does that guy get mayor again? Is, what is, anyone here from Providence, by the way? I'm sorry, sir, it's an embarrassment to your city. I think you should move. Not that we don't have problems with our politicians, right? All our speaker of the houses are all gone. But, uh, anyway, so we, we go into the restaurant, and you know, Julia, she didn't want to just go sit down with the mayor. She goes, I need to go in the kitchen. I want to talk to the, everyone. So she goes in, and she's talking to the chef. She talks to the dishwasher, the prep guy, the the bakery, it was, um, we were in the kitchen for like a half an hour. Just, you know, she knew who, she, she knew who Julia Child was and she, she loved being Julia Child. 
you know, it, it was something I've never seen before. And that's why I'm telling the story, because, you know, and then we went and sat down, we had dinner, you know, Cianci was trying to, he was all over, it was kind of sick. Um, anyway, so we get back in the car after the dinner, it was a great evening. Before we even got to the highway, what was she doing? Snoring all the way back to Harvard Square. Finally, we get back to Harvard Square, I wake her up, I go, you know, you know what, it didn't matter to me at that point because I, I learned something that night. I learned that you give, she didn't give any money, you know, it's not always about money, right? Everyone thinks you write a check, right, to charities and stuff. No, she gave herself. She went in there and she exploded Julia Child to 100 people. I mean, it was unbelievable to see this woman. And I gotta tell you, I, I emulate this woman because uh, I do this, I try to do the same thing. When I go to somewhere and they want to talk to me or meet me, I, you know, I give them as much time as I can. I I learned so much from her that night, you know. So we pull up to the driveway, and I go, Julia, I just happen to have one of your cookbooks here. Would you mind signing it for me, you know? So she, I get it out, and and she goes, Oh, sure, you know. So I'm thinking she's gonna write, you know, to Steve, what a great guy, what a great evening. She writes to Steve, Julia Child, bon appetit, right? That's it, right? <laughs> I'm like, God, you know. So anyway, we walk to the door, and then I give her a hug, and I, you know, she's like, oh, man. She goes in the house, and that's it. And then I started, she used to come to the restaurant a lot after that, you know, and it was so cool. You know, the staff couldn't believe that I was friends with Julia Child, you know. And, you know, it's kind of like, like Tom Brady, right? Everyone thinks, you know, he comes to the restaurant, and everyone, you know, him and Giselle, and, you know, it's pretty cool, right? But, you know, I love Tom, and, you know, he wrote a beautiful thing in, in the book in the back. You know, he's awesome. You know, you know Tom Brady... He's one of these guys that comes in the restaurant, and half the restaurants wants to sleep with him. And those are guys. I mean, it's crazy. Um, but, you know, I told Mike I wasn't going to get crazy. I'm sorry, Mike. Mike said, but keep it down. Uh, but, you know, it, it's when you have someone like that that you feel so strongly about, and you see them in action, you, it keeps with you. You know, so mentors to me is something uh, that is just so important. So that's my mentor story. And, you know, I. I want to tell you, you know, a lot of times restaurants go bad or your business is going bad or, you know, things happen, you know, you're getting divorced, you know, your kid is sick, you know, there's always things that are bad, you know, that go wrong, you know, and I'm always amazed. A lot of people put their head in the sand or they get really depressed or they, they can't deal with it. Well, when I was in high school, you know, I was, I was 16 years old, almost 16 and a half, and I'm telling this story because my two buddies here were, were at this story, and, and this, I, actually, this story is in the book, and... We played this team called Newburyport, this town, Newburyport. And at the time, Linfield, that's where I grew up, had never beaten Newburyport. They were 38-0. And we were a young team. We were, I think we only won a couple games that year. And uh, we played Newburyport, and we beat them. Linfield had never beat Newburyport. And my brother, who only lost five games his whole career, you know, I lost five just that one year, um, you know, had never beaten Newburyport. So it was a big deal. They had been to, like, three straight Super Bowls, and we beat them 6 to nothing in Linfield. So one of the biggest wins Linfield ever had, probably to this day. At least I think. I hope so. Uh, and so, of course, what did we have to do that night? We had to have a party, right? And the Filippo house always seemed to be the place to have a party. Uh, you know, back, you know, the drinking age was 18 then, so a lot of kids were drinking, and I wasn't 18, but I was, I had a few, I must admit. So, at the house, uh, big, huge party, and a lot of drinking going on, a lot of, a lot of stuff. And so, after the party, it was probably about 12.30, I get in my car with my girlfriend, and I have to bring her home down Main Street. By the way, these two guys played with me that day, remember? These guys. Actually, you were to my left, and you were to my right, right? We played on the same line. So... Uh, I'm driving down Main Street, and I'm probably going about 60 miles an hour, and it's about a 30 mile, because my girlfriend had to be home by, by midnight, and I think it was about 12.30, so I'm already late. And what happens? Right? The police pull me over. Right? And, um, you know, obviously I thought I was going to get in a lot of trouble. You know what? I just totally screwed up this whole story. I forgot to tell you what happened to me at the beginning of my life. What happened was, <laughs> I just totally screwed up. I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed. What happened when I was in, in, in eighth grade, I actually had a little lawn business and I chopped my finger off. I cut my hand, all right? And I had to go to the police. To, I, my mom was driving me to the police, to the, to the union hospital and a, a police officer, she, so she's driving so slow, we go into the police station, they put me in the back of the car and the police drives me down Main, Summer Street to, to Lynn Hospital and an officer Suckley is in the back seat with me to comfort me. 
And, you know, I was a little kid. I was throwing up. I was probably about 15. And, you know, you, you can see my finger. It's a little chopped off. And it was, it was a bad day for me, right? I mean, I chopped my finger off, and uh, it, it, was, it was awful. So, hence the Super Bowl, uh, after beating the Super Bowl team, we, I'm, I'm, I'm in the car now, and I'm driving down, and the, and the police officer pulls me over. And who, which officer pulls me over? It's Officer Suckley, right? And he, I give him my license, and, and he says to me, oh, Steve, hey, great win today, awesome. And he goes, let me see the finger, right? I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And I show him the finger, and he goes, wow, they did a great job. Now, first of all, I'm drunk, I'm underage, I'm speeding, right? Not, not, not too good, right? And he looks at me, and he goes, you know, you need to slow down a little bit. But you know what, great win today. Just take your girlfriend home and go right home, you know? So... I always tell the story, even though I just screwed the whole story up, um, because what could be worse than chopping your finger off, right? I mean, that's a pretty violent thing to do, a pretty bad thing to do. But actually, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, because if I didn't chop my finger off, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten to be you. I would have lost my license. I would have embarrassed my family, my name, the whole thing. So I always look at my little chopped finger, and I say, you know, that's a pretty nice little chopped finger. And, you know, so... <laughs> What, what I tell people is when you have a really bad day, you know, a lot of things turn out okay. You know, it's going to be okay. You know, just keep working at it. Don't give up. You know, have a great attitude. You know, have passion for what you do. You know, I love what I do so much. I don't work a day in my life. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm just getting started. I really do. And, you know, you might say, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. When are you going to hang it up? You know, I'm telling you. They're going to have to take me out of Davio's in a box because I'm not going anywhere, you know, and I love it so much. And, you know, I'm just going to, in closing, I just want to tell you a quick, you just stood up. Am I have to leave? <laughs> you can sit back now. Um, so he's mad at me because I screwed up the officer Suckley story. I got to tell you, I've told that story a thousand times. I never did that before. Uh, of course, I did it today. So I have to tell you about the, the, the packaging business, and I'm going to close, okay? Bob, relax, Jesus. How much coffee do you drink today, Bob? So <laughs> I just met Bob. He probably thinks I'm nuts. Uh, so back about 10 years ago, I'm in our Philadelphia restaurant on a Monday. I'm going to be quick, Bob. And all of a sudden, there's a pile of spring rolls sitting there in the kitchen. So I start eating these spring rolls. And we're a northern Italian steakhouse, right? We, we don't have spring rolls in our restaurant. So I eat them, and I said, wow, Dave, these are great. You know, you ever think, you know what, we should, we should put these on our menu at the bar. What do you think? And he looked at me, and he goes, Steve, we're an Italian steakhouse. You can't sell spring rolls. I said, why not? Let's give it a shot. See what happens, you know? So we did. We put them on the menu there, and as you guess, we got Best of Philly, and it's a huge success in Philadelphia. So after a couple years, I said to the chefs in Boston, you know those spring rolls we do in Philly? Let's do them here in Boston. Same thing, Steve, it's a Philly thing. We can't do it here. I said, you know what, let's give it a shot. So we did, and of course, they became these huge sellers. Then, a couple years go by, I'm in the restaurant. Jonathan Kraft uh, is, you know, with his Harvard buddies, you know. And, and it's funny, I, in the book, I say that he's the smartest guy I know. And when Jim Rudolph was editing, the, one of my editors who edited the book, Jim, Jim's like, Steve, how many times are you going to say he's the smartest guy I know? And I said, well, Jim, Oh, I get it. You think you're the smartest guy I know, right? So I had, so I only cut it down. I think I say it twice instead of three times because Jim was upset with me. But anyway, so he says to me, Steve, what are these things? And I tell him the story that I just told you. He goes, you know, you ever thought about selling these to like other people, like you know, other restaurants or hotels, caterers, whatever? I said, Jonathan, I'm a restaurateur. I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, well, you need to look into it and figure it out. So, you know, he's a pretty smart guy, right? So after about six months, it was bugging me, you know? So I met this woman. I actually did find a place to manufacture them. And then who was my first phone call? It was Jonathan Kraft. I called him up, and I said, Jonathan, I'd like to come see you with the spring rolls. So I come over there, and I'm in his office with him and Robert. And, you know, Robert calls him these little hoagies, uh, you know? And, and, of course, you don't correct Robert Kraft. Yes, they're hoagies, Robert, are hoagies. Uh, so they loved them so much. The chef loved them there. And they put them on the menu for the first, that next game, the first game of the season. Well, I'm at, I go to the game, and I'm sitting there, <laughs> and a guy in front of me is eating the spring rolls. And I'm with Rydy, my corporate chef, and we're like, oh, my God. So I start taking the guy's picture, and he finally looks about it, and he goes, buddy, what is your problem? What are you taking my picture for? I said, you're eating the spring roll. Like, we make that, you know, he thought I was coming on to him. It was really funny. <laughs> now I've become friends with a guy, so it's okay, but, you know, it's kind of an awkward moment. But 
after, after that, they became, it was, you know, to have Gillette Stadium was a huge, huge deal. Then we started to get into stores, and I did bring a box today. This is the box, the Philly Cheesesteak Spring Rolls, and now we're in 3,000 stores around the country. And we serve, we have a lot of other products, other flavors. Uh, they're all over the place. Locally, they're in Stop and Shop, Roach Brothers, uh, Star Market. Uh, they're all over the place. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll go buy them, and uh, you'll see we have a lot of new products coming out. I have these pasta chips coming out soon, and uh, so I'm very excited about that. So I thought, did, we, did I save any time, Bob, for questions? Sure. You know, if you didn't have nine speakers before me, I would have had more time. <laughs> <laughs> I just make sure this is my last time here, so I figure I'm going to go out with a bang. <laughs> well, we have our classics. We have our certain, like the bolognese, the, the gnocchis, you know, certain items that are Davio's signature items we, we let... They have to be, and they have to be exact. Like, when we went to Atlanta, I could not find the tomatoes that we use here in Boston, so I ship them down there. You know, certain things we, we have to do, but uh, we let each chef have about 30% of the menu because it would be too boring for them if I had to throw that menu at them in, exactly. So we, we want each dog to be a little different. Well, that's a good question, and... When we took over Davio's in 85, it was called Davio's. And even though it was on a thread of disaster and bankruptcy, uh, we, we bought the company because of the lease. Uh, the lease had another 17 years to go on it. And it was a really a low lease. Uh, it was a really good deal. So for us to change the name, it was, you know, Jim could probably tell you why, but uh, it had, had some lawyer issues there and the liquor license and all that stuff. So it was just easier just to keep the name. Plus, my brother's name's David, so we pretend we named it after him. Oh, my God. A thousand things. A thousand things. I mean, I always laugh when people say, oh, I have no regrets. You're full of shit. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Damn. I was not going to swear today. Um, but, you know, it's just crazy how many things I would change. A lot of locations were wrong. Some people were wrong. Uh, a lot of things were wrong. You know, I ate too much early on. I should have gotten shaped earlier. You know, I mean, so many things that I've done in the last five years that uh, I, I, if I'd done, if I did years ago, and I, and I got to tell you, I have a chapter, I call it the failure chapter. It's in the book. And I go through all these things, that what I did wrong. And I think you learn more from your mistakes than you do from what happens good, is, is my opinion. Uh, it's got to be my mom's meatballs, right? My dad's meatballs. I mean, because I learned the meatballs. It's funny because Davios didn't have meatballs about seven years ago. You know, it, meatballs is not an Italian. It's an American Italian thing. So Davios is a northern Italian place. So I never really wanted meatballs. Even though I love meatballs, it wasn't part of what Davios was. And then they became so hot, meatballs. So I went to my mom, and, you know, we kind of got the recipe together. And then I went to the chefs, and we worked on our, our recipe. And so now we have meatballs. And now we sell, like, 30 orders a night. It's, like, our biggest thing. So I was wrong on that one, too. So. <laughs> you know, it's okay to admit when you're wrong. Yeah. Except to your wife. That's another thing. That's <laughs> well... You know, obviously, you know, I love pasta and steak, so, I, and, and, you know, I eat that at Davio. So I tend to go to, like, other places, like uh, Toro in the South End. You know, Ken Orange is a good friend of mine. Uh, he was also on a trip to Israel with me and his wife. And uh, I, I think Toro is probably one of the most authentic, because I've been to Barcelona a bunch of times, and it's like going to Barcelona. You go into Toro, and it's, it's amazing. I, I highly recommend it. And don't call me for reservation. All right. I have more people who text me, Steve, can you get me to Toro tonight? And I'm like, of course I do help them, but so.